Okay, good morning everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I want to start by commending Derek O'Brien and his team for organising today's conference, which I think is both topical uh, and timely. It's always a great pleasure for me to talk about local government, one of the main passions of my life, uh, after my family and football, of course. Um, local governance structures uh, are always, uh, and models are always fascinating to examine and to address. Before I give you my thoughts on these matters, however, I would like to make a more general point first, which is I feel that in Ireland, uh, we are sometimes obsessed with micro-level debates on structure and form, to such an extent that sometimes I think we miss the bigger macro level issues. So the public sector reform strategy of 2011 was about shedding 40,000 people. The local government reform uh, strategy of Phil Hogan was about reducing the number of local authorities from 114 to 31. And the rhetoric was all about rationalisation, efficiencies and economy. Like, what do we want from our public sector? What kind of local government system do you want in 21st century Ireland? What services should that local government system be providing? What is the role of the state? What is the optimal scale and scope of government? I believe that if we are able to provide answers to these questions, then structure will follow more naturally. In essence, I am saying that we need to establish basic first principles. In my first class on local government in UCC with Dick Haslam 25 years ago, he told us that local government essentially exists for two fundamental reasons. One, as a local provider of public services, and two, as a democratic counterpoise to central government domination. Dick Haslam argued that it was a dangerous thing if one of these objectives overshadowed the other. If we focus entirely on efficiencies and economies of scale, we run the risk of destroying the democratic legitimacy of local government. In organisational studies, and indeed in fields like modernist architecture and industrial design, there are ongoing debates about whether form should follow function. And I think it is a pertinent debate too for local government uh, to have. Altering the structure of local governance will not, in of itself, fix the weaknesses inherent in the Irish sub-national system. If there is a genuine will to reform local government, we must take a holistic approach, encompassing discussions on constitutional protection, functions, powers, finance, as well as capacity and competency requirements. Within this holistic approach, there should of course be room to discuss governance structures and, for example, moving towards a model of directly elected mayors. The former Dublin city manager, John Tierney, has argued that grafting a directly elected mayor onto the current system without any meaningful changes to local government responsibilities and financing will not make any appreciable difference. This supports the argument previously put forward by our eminent keynote speaker, Colin Copus, that the elected mayoral model has struggled in the UK partly due to the lack of power and meaning of local government itself. We can point, of course, to international trends with regard to local governance. For example, there is little doubt that the strengthening of executive leadership at local level is an enduring theme. This is often manifested through a model of strong directly elected mayors. Countries with directly elected mayors are now the biggest group within Europe, with the numbers growing significantly in the 1990s. But are there other trends? In the United States, the mayoral model is in decline, and the proportion of US local authorities using the council manager system has risen from a third to a half over the past 25 years. Colin has discussed the UK experience with directly elected mayors, but it does appear that the public has not taken to the concept, although this does not make it a bad idea. <coughs> The Conservative Liberal Democrats coalition government initiated 10 mayoral referendums in selected English cities in 2012. Only in one did the people decide to establish the office of mayor, in Bristol, as we have seen, on a 24% turnout. Fenwick and Elcock concluded in 2014, overall there is no evidence of widespread public support for mayors, yet the prospect of more mayors, indeed mayors with enhanced powers, remains firmly on the policy agenda. This is interesting but also puzzling, 
a major continuing policy initiative is built on few empirical foundations. Personally, I see a lot of merit in the concept of directly elected mayors. I also think, and it hurts me as a Corkman to admit this, but Dublin does warrant its own local governance structures due to its special position within Ireland. As Jamie Cudden wrote last year in administration, the future will be won or lost in the world cities. Dublin can become an important hub in the global economy, and it requires governance structures to support rather than hinder this aspiration. In August, Harry McGee had an article in the Irish Times making a case for an elected mayor for Dublin. He argued, correctly in my view, Dublin isn't competing with Limerick or Waterford. Its rivals include London, Paris, Berlin, Madrid and Barcelona. It's competing with them for investment, tourism and conferences. The key sentence in his article, however, is the following. The city needs an identifiable, medium-term political leader who can speak on its behalf and will have powers to influence transport and traffic policy, sustainable transport, tourism, trade and economy, marketing, infrastructure and other services. It's hard to disagree with this sentence, but given the fact that most of the powers McGee cites are currently outside the functional remit of Irish local government, what he is proposing is a radical shift in central local relations. Is there the political will to make this shift? I am not convinced that there is. I am even more certain that the officials in the Custom House, and it's good that Dermot came at this precise moment, uh, I also believe that the officials in the Custom House do not want to see it happen. Our efforts over the past 15 years are telling. In 2001, under Noel Dempsey, we actually passed legislation to introduce directly elected mayors. This was repealed by Martin Cullen two years later. John Gormley was the next to have a go, but for a variety of reasons, his 2008 white, white paper, which contained a useful and well-framed discussion on directly elected mayors, never came to fruition. Phil Hogan's 2014 plan for a directly elected mayor for the Dublin metropolitan region was booby-trapped from the outset, with a two-step mechanism that the four Dublin local authorities would firstly have to individually adopt a resolution in favour of holding a plebiscite on the issue. I think Harry McGee is overly generous in his conclusion that Hogan had some great ideas, but also a scattergun approach to their implementation. My conclusion would be harsher. Between the minister and the officials, the plan was deliberately sabotaged from the inside. Again, I point to something that Colin Copus has previously written along the lines of the Nike tagline, which is just do it. If central government genuinely believes in directly elected mayors, and that's a big if, I think, it should fully commit to the idea and legislate for its adoption rather than taking the kind of hesitant, half-hearted approaches we have seen over the past 15 years. The Green Party produced an interesting document last year, which was quite catchy. It read, four local authorities, four chief executives, four mayors, 183 councillors and countless state agencies. Who do you call if you want to call Dublin? It's a bit like Colin's reference to Ghostbusters. I think this makes a good point, but I might also add that in a functioning democracy, multiple voices and opinions are to be encouraged, should one voice speak for Dublin. This for me is the nub of the issue. We need a debate and greater clarity on the details, and especially the powers of the mayor and the relationship between the mayor and a local legislator or council. Ideally, the debate should be evidence-based. Not all of the arguments in favour, or indeed against, directly elected mayors actually stand up to scrutiny. Hamilton, for example, challenges the point that cities need directly elected mayors in order to compete in a rapidly globalising world. He cites Copenhagen, Melbourne and Prague as examples of successful cities which do not have directly elected mayors. I would assert that for a city to compete, it needs effective and strong local government, and that may or may not include a directly elected mayor. 
There are many different models of directly elected mayors across the world which we should examine. In America, there is a world of difference between the strong and weak mayor versions. In the strong model, the mayor tends to have absolute veto power over the council. When I interviewed the mayor of Albany, he stressed that he worked independently of council. He said to me, I'm not obliged to go to council meetings, thank God. I had a fascinating interview with the mayor of Schenectady, who was boasting about his powers and the fact that having inherited what he called a fiscal train wreck, he was able to turn around the economic fortunes of the city due to his extensive powers. What he failed to mention was that the fiscal train wreck had been created by his predecessor, a mayor with strong powers who had bankrupted the city. I cannot finish without quick reference to Cork and its possible governance arrangements if the city and county councils are merged. I am strongly against this proposed merger and I think there are significant inconsistencies and inaccuracies in the Smitty Majority Report. The Smitty Report calls for a merger of the two local authorities, meaning the effective abolition of Cork City Council. Its status would be reduced to a city within a municipal district within a metropolitan division, within a unified super council. New layers would be created when the core idea apparently was to simplify and rationalize. On page 49 of the report, it states that the unified council may or may not meet as a full 86 member assembly. As an alternative, it suggests that the size of the unified council could be limited to facilitate more streamlined decision making. Helpfully, at this point in brackets, it states, say 30 members, to give us a guide as to the number. What does this mean exactly? You have 86 councillors elected from the city and county's electoral areas to sit on the unified council, but a select few, say 30, will be allowed on the super council to make major strategic decisions. What will the other not so super 56 councillors be doing? Will they be back in their divisions? How do we select the 30? Will people know when they are voting that some councillors will be super councillors and some will not? As if this was not bizarre enough, the report recommends that the city would have a directly elected mayor. So the city, within the municipal district, within the metropolitan division, within the unified super council, would have a directly elected mayor while the super unified authority would not have a directly elected mayor. To my mind, this is crazy and beggars belief. It points again to the fact that we need precision and we need details. We can talk about London all we want, but that model is based on a directly elected regional mayor and a 25 person assembly. Underneath, there are a myriad of local borough councils and Geoffrey Evans, for example, is the Lord Mayor of the City of London. What do we mean by a directly elected mayor for Dublin? Do we keep the four existing local authorities underneath? Will each of these have its own mayor? Will the city continue to have its Lord Mayor? For that matter, what do we mean by the Dublin region? Are we talking about the area currently covered by the four local authorities or are we spreading into other counties? My conclusion is simple and based on three points. One, we need an evidence-based debate in which the details are discussed, especially the powers of the mayor and the relationship with the local legislature. Two, this debate should provide us with clarity over the best model for Dublin. And three, we then need commitment from government to implement, not the half-hearted nonsense we have seen over the years. My final comments are about eggs. At present, Dublin is a curate's egg, partly good and partly bad, but it has the potential to be so much better. As C.S. Lewis wrote, it may be hard for an egg to turn into a bird. It would be a jolly sight harder for it to learn to fly while remaining an egg. We are like eggs at present, and you cannot go on indefinitely being just a good, ordinary, decent egg. We must be hatched or go bad. It's high time that Dublin was hatched. Thank you.